Our next speaker is uh, Mark Millis on Breakthrough Propulsion Studies, Assessing Interstellar Flight Challenges and Prospects. Uh, Mark was a NASA leader of, propulsion, of um, the Breakthrough Propulsion Physics. He's currently with Ohio Aerospace Institute. So uh, please join me in welcoming his talk. And just for a little bit of uh, humor on this, I found this kind of appropriate phrase and from an appropriate audience or speaker. I'm sorry for the delay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, with that, we'll move on. I'm Mark G. Millis, and I'm going to be talking about the Breakthrough Propulsion Study, which is about assessing interstellar flight challenges and prospects. I'm going to be covering two things in this presentation. First, a refresher on interstellar flight itself, the ambitions and the challenges that go with it. And then I'll be updating about the status of the NASA grant that I've been working called Breakthrough Propulsion Study. Uh, just to get started, some um, history uh, of efforts looking into interstellar flight. Going back to 1976, Robert Forward actually proposed a program for interstellar exploration to Congress, and that is in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. Uh, some other significant ones are the Starflight Handbook. There was also one by Malden Prospects for Interstellar Travel. Um, in 2001, and this one's harder to find, the Interstellar Spaceflight Primer, which gave a um, uh, summaries of the different uh, propulsion tactics, uh, Paul Gilster Centauri Dreams. And then um, there's been several things in the British Interplanetary Society. I mean, they've been publishing interstellar uh, flight topics for some time, but a number of um, special issues devoted to that, including ones that covered the um, Starship, 100-year Starship uh, conference, the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshops, and, and things like that, and, and more. But uh, so th this has been going on for a while. As far as interstellar flight ambitions, what interstellar space has that we don't have in our solar system are potentially habitable planets. And a main source of information that I go for for this is the, um, uh, the site at Arecibo, which has this catalog of habitable planets. Um, this particular chart, they're ranked by distance from Earth. They also have a chart that's ranked by ESI number. Earth Similarity Index, where the closest potentially habitable uh, star, Proxima Centauri b, I think has a, a similarity index rating of 80. Um, but this keeps updating, and that there are that many um, potentially habitable planets uh, within relatively short distances, the first two rows are all within 22 light years, is fascinating. Now this chart's a little bit more complicated, and I'll walk you through it. The point is, is to explain how far are stuff out there and how fast do you need to go on human time scales to get anywhere? Um, the bottom of the chart is distance and starting out in astronomical units and then uh, light years, spanning the entire diameter of the galaxy. And the time scale goes all the way to the uh, time from when our Earth will no longer be habitable, when the sun has boiled away all the Earth oceans. The diagonal lines are speeds, and um, the white lines are factors of light speed, and each line is going up by a factor of 10. And something to note, each time you go up by a factor of 10 in speed, you go up by a factor of at least 100 in the amount of energy that it would take. So the way to use this chart, if you want to say, if I want to get to Alpha Centauri, which is the line there, within a century, which is in here, you cross there and you see that you're probably going to need to go almost 10% the speed of light. Um, if you want to reach potentially habitable uh, inhabited exoplanets, and this is an estimate of where they might be from a 2010 study, um, in a human lifetime, you see, well, you'd have to actually break the light speed barrier. So this is kind of a way of compressing down into one small chart um, our entire galaxy and how fast you need to get there. But with these logarithmic charts, it's really hard to convey the true scale of size. And to do that, on the back wall of the auditorium there, I have a series of 25-foot ribbons, and this is a summary of one of them. The first one is up to 1,000 astronomical units, and this is a linear chart um, instead of logarithmic. So each time you move an inch, it's another uh, factor of distance. 
And so you can see Neptune and Voyager here. Um, out here is the um, solar gravitational lens and all the way to uh, 1,000 astronomical units. Um, now, to actually reach a interstellar region, Proxima Centauri, I needed to go to an entirely different 25-foot ribbon. And that in first 1,000 astronomical unit ribbon, when compressed in the same scale as the um, one to Alpha Centauri, it it's compresses down to only an inch. So the difference of going to 1,000 astronomical units um, is roughly the comparison of traveling one inch of 25 feet compared to getting to Alpha Centauri. I've also done similar comparisons, linear scales with speeds. Uh, this first one of the 25 foot long ribbon um, covers 1000 astronomical units in 50 years, which is the uh, predicted ability of the interstellar precursor missions that are being studied right now based on using foreseeable technology. They think they can reach 1000 astronomical units in 50 years. Well, when compared with um, interstellar flight speeds, you go to the second ribbon, and here I've used 20% the speed of light, which is the one that Starshot is using. And on that scale, uh, the first speed, 1,000 astronomical units in 50 years, is only one half of an inch of that 25 feet. So the scales of um, speeds that we need to travel for interstellar flight versus what we can achieve today are uh, vastly different. An important point is that we've been using speed as kind of our iconic measure of um, challenge. And indeed, it's easy to use that. But the thing we need to remember when it comes down to the technology challenge, the biggest challenge is speed, which goes as a square of velocity at least. Um, and the reason why this is worth mentioning is because all the things about energy conversion and uh, heat rejectors and um, efficiency, those become very substantial at the type of energy levels that we need for interstellar flight. Regarding uh, those energy levels, now this chart, the dark diagonal line, is the average prediction. If you extend um, the rate of human energy prowess over time, how much energy we uh, have per year. Um, and this data goes back at least a quarter century. Um, and extrapolate that out, you get this diagonal line. And plus or minus one standard deviation are these two other diagonal lines. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty there. So anyway, the question is, well, how much energy do you need to do interstellar flight versus how much energy that we have? Another point I need to make is that the scale of the amount of available energy here is one millionth of the total human energy, because I don't think we'll be devoting all of humanity's energy to an interstellar mission. And I've got the figure one millionth because of looking at the space shuttle energy requirements over their 25 year span to the amount of energy that humanity was using at that span, it ended up being one millionth. So I figure that's a pretty good representation. At the bottom here, and well within the realm of uh, what we could potentially reach, are 10 Starshot probes by virtue of their kinetic energy. Now, remember talking before, the, it's not just the base energy, but the including all the inefficiencies, how much you need to go there. And so if you ask about how much beam energy you need to do 10 Starshots, that's at this higher level. And at this level, assuming these... Um, first order approximations, um, that might be into the next century we'd have, before we'd have enough energy to do that. When you start talking probes that are launched by rockets, it gets considerably more difficult. Um, and you see here, it might be many centuries before that. And we're talking here 10% speed, 10% uh, of light speed, a 100 kilogram probe, and whether you're just talking the kinetic energy or the um, actual rocket energy um, with, I believe it was, uh, a million seconds specific impulse. So there's a, a completely, I mean, the amount of energy you need for this versus the amount of energy available is a huge challenge. The other aspect that comes into play is the length of missions and also the um, development time. Um, the 
precursor missions that are being talked about now, they're talking 50 years to reach 1,000 astronomical units, and that's the first scale. And I also have that by decades out here. And beneath here, I have prior historic um, technology revolutions, and I'll get back to those. The breakthrough starshot predictions that will give almost two decades to prep, uh, two decades to travel. And in 2017, they were saying it would take another two decades to transmit the data back on the low energy. Um, at this 2019 event, they're saying they've got that down to two years. Um, you also have the time of flight signal. This next one is the from the congressional language of um, launching an interstellar probe that can achieve 10% light on the 100th anniversary of Apollo, which gives us that many decades to prepare, and that would be the uh, transit time. So you see you're talking missions and including the data transmission that are roughly on the order of a half century or a century. When you compare that to history, I mean, it was 100 years between the Jules Verne story of shooting a cannon um, before we actually did Apollo. The, from the steam era to the rocket era was about a century. Uh, one that surprised me is that it only took six decades to go from the discovery of uh, the nuclear radiation to having a reactor on the power grid. The point being here is that the time scale for significant technological developments and the time scale of interstellar missions are roughly comparable. So in planning for these things to keep in mind possibilities of technological revolutions to not just rule them out summarily. The um, incentive trap and the incessant obsolescence postulate is that if we're in a situation that no matter when we choose to launch a probe, if it's likely to get passed by something launched later with more modern equipment, why ever start? And the really important thing is that doesn't really matter that much. That only matters if your motivation is to get there first. Um, and even if that's the motivation that's been shown, uh, the term weight equation was to show it, that you'll real reach a point um, where uh, if you wait longer, you won't get there faster. But the main thing from this, this used to be something thought of as like a reason to procrastinate, um, but it's really not that big of a deal and can easily be ignored now because there's other motivations behind just getting there first. There's the technological advances made in the course of trying all these different solutions, um, what you learn along the way from the science on the probe, and then there's the societal implications too. There was mentioned before about survival of humanity being a motivation, which is certainly a rather significant motivation. Um, so any attempt, even now for what we learn, um, you don't need to wait till you reach the weight equation situation. So boiling all those down into uh, what are the real technical challenges that we'll have to overcome. And even though the NASA study I'm doing concentrates on propulsion, some really important challenges deal with the payload, the communication. How can you get a decent data rate with the least amount of power and um, mass? And since we might be talking years for getting the data back, that is a significant portion. Um, the navigation ability, um, I mean, the pointing accuracy for what we could probably do is OK. But once you get to the destination, will you be able to acquire the target and, and put your science things on there. This other one I want to bring up, I mean, astronomy is going to be able to do a lot, but what can you put on the probe and what can you measure that uh, the astronomy will not be able to do, that added value? Um, the other one to keep in mind is the this probe is going to be out there for decades, and its energy source is going to be mostly dormant for that time. So how can you have a really high density, lots of joules per kilogram uh, power source that's going to last for a very long time? What are our minimums on that? What's the, the best that we can do? And then the other part is that even after you've only gone one light year away, a round trip or a, um, a, a closed loop communication thing would be a two year discussion. So these probes are going to have to be autonomous and be able to have, figure out everything on their own once they're launched. Now the propulsion one, we've talked about getting out there quickly, but do you want to slow down when you get there or might you need to maneuver? And that can certainly be considered the part of it. The speed, to put the numbers of what our challenge is, if going from the Juno spacecraft 
up to its performance up to 10% light speed is a factor of 400 um, improvement, which is a substantial challenge. But then when you take that with the energy, square that, that's 160,000 times more energy. So that's the challenge we're facing to get up to that point. And when you're talking that much extra energy, the inefficiencies of conversion and the heat rejection you need become more substantial. And the last one on this list of big challenges is the infrastructure um, that's needed. Uh, and a little bit of history there. Um, the Starshot, they're talking about a Earth-based laser system, which is a lot easier than a space-based one. Uh, but even still, there's a, you know, that's breaking uh, precedence. They're talking about a one square kilometer array of one million 100 kilowatt lasers all synchronized. That's a pretty substantial challenge. But the old ideas, the Robert Forward's light sails and even the Daedalus, well, Robert Forward was talking about like a 26 terawatt laser, a 1,000 kilometer Fresnel lens out at about uh, 10 astronomical units. Daedalus needed 50,000 metric tons of helium-3 mined from the gas janet. So the, the infrastructure that's needed to support that is not a uh, trivial matter. So that's a quick review, kind of get the scale of the challenges that we're facing, and now a little bit of look about, well, what's going on about it, and, and using today as an example. There's those precursor probe ideas, the idea of with the technology that we know we can do and the next set of improvements that we can know we do, what's our best performance? And it looks like a thousand astronomical units in 50 years is a reasonable thing to aim for. The Breakthrough Starshot folks, they're going for pushing the miniaturization as much as possible and also the laser sails. The NASA workshop at the second half of this is going to be looking at a broad of advanced propulsion concepts. This symposium and the other discussion groups are going to be looking at progress in general and a bunch of the other um, implications and things. And the part that I'm going to be talking about now is the NASA study to figure out with all those options, how do you decide where you might want to focus your research? Now, clarification, I ran into this enough to where I need to say it explicitly. This study is not about picking the next interstellar mission and its technology. The technology has to be advanced to the point where it's the, your predictions are accurate for trade studies to get to that point. We're not there. Instead, this study is for equitability. We're trying to figure out, when looking at these things, how do you look at them in a balanced way? of the, uh, all the various options and your mission choices to help guide research things. And we hope to create a research planning tool that will be ongoing as well as a web accessible database that will have the various interstellar approaches on there all according to some standard measures to make it easy to compare them. Things that are not within the scope of the study is um, about the precursor missions. That technology is ready for trade studies, so the methods that we're doing on this study don't apply for it. Um, and also, it's not really a true interstellar mission. It only goes a half of a percent the way there. Um, also, we're not talking human interstellar flight, even though for the database it would be nice to have the information on there. But the real challenges for human interstellar flight aren't the propulsion, it's the sustainable survivability, both physically and culturally. So that's a whole other cool issue that we're not um, dealing with. The grant's in three stages. The first stage was to ask, well, what questions should we be asking? How would we sort these things out in an even manner? And the second stage, um, oh, and the report for that's complete. My last chart has a URL for where you can get a copy of that. The second stage, it just started in October, is to create a database where we collect the specific uh, questions um, so that you can all see them and all that feed into the analysis in the third year. The main point I want to bring up here, this isn't just a matter of looking at the technologies. This is also a matter of looking at your mission choices, deciding whether or not you want to slow down when you get there whether you want a probe that has a faster data rate and perhaps a longer transit time or whatever. So it's both a comparison of mission options and the technology options uh, to see what might uh, be better to look at and also the potential impact of the research choices. And if you're a technologist, if you have a new idea for a propulsion method or an interstellar mission thing, how would you get your idea fairly assessed in comparison with one of those? So this is a, a, a method to hopefully create that kind of process. I'll skip that one in the interest of time. That was how we uh, went about doing the first stage. 
The challenges of why you just can't do traditional trade studies for this is that um, the various ideas that are out there used inconsistent mission goals. They, the payloads were different, sometimes the destinations were different, and so um, that makes comparing them difficult. The different propulsion methods, their measures of how you compare their own goodness are inconsistent with each other. You know, rockets talk about specific impulse and thrust, a solar sail or beamed energy sails, or beam divergence on uh, the sail mass um, and warp drives, in, you know, stress energy tensor, the bubble thickness. And by the way, when I set this up with NASA, NASA did ask that we include the um, undiscovered propulsion physics, if you were, the, uh, the goals of warp drives and space drives, and somehow figure out a way to uh, do those. An important one here, the performance predictions of these various ideas, even some of the near technology, it still has not really been demonstrated in lab. So when they say, can you really do one million seconds ISP? What are those levels? And so uh, coming up with assessment methods that can handle that ambiguity. Um, the readiness levels of the different approaches are significantly different. And um, the required infrastructure has I mean, it's been kind of roughly scoped out, but not in enough detail to take that into consideration. And a really key one here, the motives of how you decide which method is better, what's your measure of goodness, those really haven't been explicit. And uh, historically, it's been, well, what can get there the fastest? But as I mentioned before, there's other reasons for doing it. So to respond to that, what we're doing is that um, we're picking analysis methods that are consistent with um, provisional data, um, explicitly mentioning what the figures of merit will be, um, the various propulsion concepts, we're going to take them and we're going to need to scaling information because we're going to be comparing them against the same mission baselines to see how they fare. Um, and when comparing the propulsion methods, we're distilling and converting their performance measures into some of the basic fundamental physics of energy, time, and mass. And then a work breakdown structure is there for some consistency of, of labeling. So those are the basic techniques for how to uh, sort these things out. As far as the analysis methods, which will really be into the third stage, but preparing for the database means asking the right questions that we can do these. Um, we want to be able to compare both adjusting your mission ambitions and your technology options because we're not really sure uh, what's what's the, I mean, how much difference does it make if you slow down uh, to how valuable a mission might be? We're using both correlative and deterministic uh, analysis. Deterministic, I'll mention that one first because it's the more familiar one. That's the laws of motion. But the problem with deterministic analyses is they're only as good as the information going in, which right now we don't know if that information is all that accurate. So the correlative one, and here's a couple of references where that's been looked at before, um, one of which is from the NASA person who's in the line of um, sponsoring the study, um, looks at these more basically, and the kind of outputs they have, the topological maps, look something like this. Now, these are just hypothetical examples of showing correlations, in this case, different propulsion options with different features that you're going to measure goodness for the mission. And then this one is different um, areas of research versus the propulsion things to try and begin to see if there's some areas that have that are more impactive um, than others and where you might concentrate on trying to get your more refined details that you can do with a deterministic analysis. Uh, this is a basic analysis flow diagram. I'm not going to go into this in detail other than to point out you pick what your mission parameters are, you pick what propulsion method you are, and then it will crank through to give you down your figures of merit and your timeline for how that might be for some of the comparison. And some of these things go more than one way, um, meaning do you specify your entire mission time and then have to back out of that to your transit time and your communication time? Or do you specify those and then figure out what your mission time will be? But um, I thought it would spend more time on the figures of merit. The how do you decide relative values? And uh, 40 categories there. The value of the mission itself, which that's been expanded. Uh, time and cost, those are pretty much obvious. Um, and then return on investment, which I'll say a little bit more. But the value of the mission, uh, there's the subjective factors. 
which destination are you doing? That's subjective, but you can put uh, ranking values on those and, and uh, quantities. The ones in blue are actually um, numeric. And um, like, how close are you going to get to the target? So obviously, the closer you are, the better your data fidelity will be, your resolution of what you think you can pick up. How long are you going to be within range where your science instruments can take that data? And when talking about flybys, that becomes a significant issue. And well, how much data are you going to get? There hasn't been any standard of any of those lined up yet. And when comparing the options, we'll impose the same standards and then see how things go. And then also adjust those standards to see how that affects things. Um, and then the other one, to include the motivations, not just talking about firsts, um, but how much science you do at the destination, the technology gains in the process of developing the technology there, and then a, the societal benefits. And so if, if you have two otherwise identical um, options and one m covers more of those um, motives, then that would be ranked higher. So that's the uh, process and principle. Now that idea of how long are you within um, instrumentation range of your target. And the way this chart works is these are assumed different ranges of, of your instrumentation range. I mean, if you only are can take data if you're within a half of an astronomical unit and you're flying by at 20% 20 uh, 20 the speed of light, you're less than an hour within instrumentation range. Now if you expand that out to 100 astronomical units, okay, then you're within range for about six days. And the 10% uh, light speed one, okay, if you're half an astronomical unit, that's roughly one and a half hours. But the, the important point here is that these times are really short. And after you've been en route for decades, to have you know just a few hours at the destination, do we really want to consider maybe slowing down? And so that's part of the uh, decision space now. As far as examples of baseline mission scenarios, the three at the bottom here are pretty much uh, pretty obvious. So a Centauri flyby, a Centauri slow down, or actually put get in orbit on Centauri. Uh, the other three who are faded out, these are the more precursor mission things, um, going to the gravitational lens uh, area. They're in here because there's still good comparisons to flesh out some of the technologies. Even though this study is interested in true interstellar, reaching an exoplanet, um, these uh, shorter destinations are still useful for doing some of the comparisons. So this is kind of the baseline missions. And also for a starting payload size on the order of 100 uh, kilograms. But these are things that can be um, varied. Okay, one of the things that, um, making a new statement, is the mission completion is no longer defined as when it arrives. It's defined as when does the data get back to Earth. That's to realize that this issue of data rate is not a trivial issue that is part of the trade space on making decisions. Um, and so all of those times. The time to build these things, the large dataless and the large uh, laser sales that Robert Ford envisioned, you know, those aren't going to be something you can build in you know, five to ten years. Those might take decades themselves. Um, cost. This cost is not going to be measured in dollars. It's going to be measured in energy. Again, that's a fundamental physics, fundamental currency of all physical transitions, and it doesn't need any debatable cost models. It's just the most raw value that we can have. Now, if you want to throw cost models on there later, you can use energy as a starting point. And that includes both the energy for your propulsion and also the energy to build these things. And so far, a lot of the ideas um, are rather substantial with the infrastructure that they need. And then the return on investment, one way of measuring that, and this is something where there's, uh, this is not a, a firm decision yet, but comparing the kinetic energy that you actually imparted to the probe versus your total propulsion energy. So a more efficient propulsion method that takes less energy to get your con uh, payload up to speed would be more value. Um, to do the conversions of the various methods into energy, what we did is we realized that if we broke the propulsion methods up into, excuse me, um, four groups, depending upon whether their energy was on board and their reaction mass was on board, that was one category. So the 
the equations to kind of sort them out are kind of generic for those four categories. Um, and the final report from the first year has more detail on that. I'm not going to go into those in detail, but that's basically the, um, the way of doing it. And so the, the factors that we want to pull from doing those analysis is what's the total propulsion energy, uh, what's going to be your spacecraft launch mass, because that will scale into making your infrastructure estimates, and how much supporting infrastructure do you need to also support the mission, especially for those where perhaps laser sail is a separate system from the, the spacecraft. The infrastructure energy, um, kind of a, okay, that's right, I do cover it later. Uh, the simple way of thinking is that a vehicle that requires, uh, that it's twice as massive is going to take twice as much energy to build it and probably twice as much time to build it. So that's kind of our simple ruler, which means that you need to know, well, what is your infrastructure's ability in, say, joules per kilogram of processing thing? And then also, what power do you have with your infrastructure for how quickly you can do that? And when looking at data about future infrastructure, there's not much out there yet. The blue line is just a um, an extension or extrapolation of world energy production. That's kind of like maybe a starting point to get to put some scale on it. But we're going to have to come up with some uh, provisional numbers on here of how fast we'll be able to build that infrastructure. So when comparing the two different propulsion concepts that are requiring infrastructure, when one might be able to launch before the other. Um, and if one requires substantial more energy, it might be decades down the line before it's ready. Um, now the next important part on this, on all of these things, especially uh, and two on um, remaining technology development time, I'm not trying to create accurate absolute predictions, like yes, the infrastructure will have such and such ability by that time. We're trying to come up with reasonable baselines and compare those same baselines equitably to the different propulsion methods. So it will be possible to do relative comparisons if we're applying the same comparative rules to all the different devices. And that also includes when doing the, um, the remaining technology development time. And speaking of that, there's at least two different uh, aspects. One is once you have a new device or a conceivable way with a new performance value, whether it be an ISP level or um, uh, watts per kilogram or whatever, how long is it going to take advancing that through uh, the technology readiness scales before it's uh, mission ready? And the basic strategy there is, is, is roughly same ratios of going through the technology readiness scales, but where more complex systems require more time for each of those scales. So that's kind of like the rough order of rulers to get to that. The next one is the pace of performance level increases. Those tend to go historically in um, S-curves of technology development. Um, and the reason that we're using that, aside from that it's a very recurring pattern in history, is that if you're dealing with a concept that's very close to the upper physics limits of what's possible, the amount of time it might take to get up to that um, might be longer than if you're at something that's at a, a lower stage. So to have a way of uh, incorporating that is um, part of the studies. Now there's other things there, and I want to look at a little bit more, some other guys that are in the final report of talking about how else to possibly do that. that so that one's still um, definitely a work in progress. Now, I had discussions with NASA and also my collaborator of, of whether to use an illustrative example to um, uh, provoke attention, and this seemed like a good one. Like, let's say you're comparing a fusion rocket, which we have a rough idea that we know how to do, with a warp drive that we don't even know if it's technically feasible. But, I mean, we know that the, um, the Daedalus one, for example, is going to require a very long time of infrastructure. And the warp drive is probably going to take a very long time of physics. But if it doesn't require infrastructure and it's faster, would it end up being faster in the long run and, uh, and ready sooner? And hopefully by squaring these things out 
and having the same rules applied to the different ones and getting some estimates on these in a reliable enough fashion, we'll be able to kind of do those comparisons. This is just the work breakdown structure. This is repeating many of the things that are there that the figures are merit. And so when it comes time to create the database, there'll be some at least some standardization so you can, um, uh, when reading these things, you can understand them, comparing them one to the other. As far as the databases, right now there's three envisioned portals, if you will, or, or different ways of doing it. One is for uploading and viewing the information by subject matter experts. Another one will be the actually conducting the analysis parts. And right now, um, the plan is, is that something for NASA? Hopefully, in the, the third stage, uh, we'd like to have that so that if you're online, you can try your own analyses and adjusting your mission parameters to see how it does. And then also a, um, a summary one that's less detailed for public education on there. And some of the information that, will, that we will be seeing for the, uh, the first one, list of mission and vehicle concepts, including the classical ones, the Daedalus, the Star Wisp, the other ones, um, our baseline mission scenarios by which other things are going to be compared, the specific payload masses and data rates and things like that, and also uh, spelling out the infrastructure requirements more explicitly this time on each of those. The next level of detail there are the propulsion concepts and the kind of information that we're going to be needing is scalable measures um, because we want to compare these for very small payloads or larger ones and uh, so we're, the, the form that the information has to be in has to help do that. And the one that comes to mind the most is that when looking at various concepts and they assume a certain uh, mass for their heat rejectors, um, well how did you determine what value are you using and it would be fair t for the competing methods to use the same measures for some of these technologies so someone hasn't skewed their study by having overly optimistic uh, heat rejection masses. So the level of information that was used in your propulsion ideas for some of those factors, we want those listed too. Um, and then uh, information that helped uh, judge the technology readiness and an important one, what are the next research steps that you actually have to do for your idea? Uh, again, this is coming down to how do we help sort out what the picking for research options? So what are the research options? What would you do next? And um, what would be on the table to pick from? And then the other uh, piece on that is provisional roadmaps for um, not just that next step, but advancing your technology all the way to, to flight readiness. And I'm glad to see with the propulsion workshop that's on the, the second half that coming up with those things are uh, what's in there. Now, to put this in kind of scale, the, the variables for just the mission choices themselves, there's roughly about a couple of dozen of those, um, roughly 30 for the propulsion specifications, um, only about six for the infrastructure, and uh, there's seven for figures of merit, and then there's about 20 or so of other variables in there to mesh these all together. So if you wanna see what's been thought of so far about how these comparisons are actually gonna be made, what variables are, those are in the final report. Now getting the information into the report, we're gonna have a separate contractor actually make the shell for us, but then uh, we're gonna start with NASA, presumably on uh, using a laser sail version as a good benchmark and a uh, fusion rocket as another benchmark to go through and make sure that the kind of questions and the information that we want meshes with what information is actually determinable and a little do some iterations there. Then we're going to reach a point where we're going to have to reach out to the greater interstellar community to have subject matter experts upload things. And we have some funding set aside for some honoraria to help do that. Um, if new information needs to be created on that. And that's something that is gonna take a few months to figure out how to, what we might need to call on and go about that. Another critical thing is making sure the information is reliable. Um, and that's still a work in progress too about how to go through that. But definitely what we want is that any information that's loaded in, you have to cite the reference from, to, for how to defend why you got those values you did. And if you're looking at the database and you see someone else uh, flag a number, say for how uh, 
much mass a magnetic nozzle might be and it doesn't look right, then by all means um, flag that to us and suggest what reference would be a better reference for using that. And we're hoping uh, that this will be an ongoing reference, that the information will be on there for years and as things get updated or more refined, it will be there. It's just kind of also a cool thing for the public to check in on. And for my closing chart, the reference for the, uh, the first report, that's where the URL is. It's about 69 pages. Um, again, the, the next step that we're starting just now, actually early October is when the second, the grant renewal got squared away. So we haven't been into it very much. Um, and preparing for this workshop was uh, most of that, um, is to create that database. And then the third uh, will be the figuring out how to do all the analysis and the interactions uh, with that. And for the acknowledgement, this wasn't funded by a NIAC, um, one of their traditional things, but it's the same uh, office uh, specifically. It started with Jay Faulkner and Jason Derlith, and now Dr. Mike LaPointe is the contract monitor on it. Uh, the first stage grant was done under that, and now the second stage is under a, um, a renewal on a different grant. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you.